My top title is herbicide resistant weeds and it, our title, full title is in the irrigated pasture, but we're gonna be talking about um, resistance across all landscapes. So whether you've got in your rangeland for your pasture or irrigated pasture, even in your lawn, um, living in town, I see quite a few of some of these weeds popping up in people's lawns as well. So we're gonna cover a little bit of everything. Also to note, I'll um, point out all of the graphs I'm gonna be sharing are all from weedscience.org and they were updated this past January of 2021. Um, I'm only sharing a few of them. So if you're interested in this, in this topic and seeing where we're at, um, you can go there for more information. So um, to start off, a lot of people typically think of um, resistance issues with one chemical in particular, glyphosate. Um, common trade name for that is Roundup. Um, I think especially with Roundup ready corn, Roundup ready cotton, Roundup ready alfalfa, there has been a lot of concern about um, creating a resistance to glyphosate. Um, but we have actually seen resistance starting back in 1957 was the first time we had any documented resistance to an herbicide and really didn't see much of anything until about the mid 70s. And then, as you can see, this is global numbers, not just the United States. Um, resistance has really sort of taken off and skyrocketed so that in January 2021, there were 522 unique cases of herbicide resistance being reported globally. So this is something that I think we all need to be aware of and concerned about and making sure that we do our part to help try to reduce any resistance issues. One of the big reasons for that is back in the 70s, there were a lot of chemicals being approved every year to be used. We have less and less coming on the market each year, less and less being approved each year. So the tools in the toolbox are getting smaller and we're seeing more and more resistance. So we want to try to do all we can to keep as many tools as options as possible. So this graph, um, I parsed out, it's parsing out the different countries, the resistance you see, and the blue dots is the US. And that graph is pretty similar to what we saw for globally. Um, but I think it's important to note we started having a resistance issue a little bit later than um, Europe did. They saw much more of a resistance issue faster than we did, um, but we passed them on how many, um, how many chem uh, weeds have been resistant to herbicides. Also interesting that Brazil and China really have sort of escaped this a little bit, but they are also starting to trend up. So all of us are starting to trend up in resistance that we are seeing. So it's definitely becoming more of an issue and more of a concern and it's really probably about the last 15 years that there's been a dramatic increase in resistance. And as I sort of touched on earlier leading into this, a lot of us think of glyphosate as the one that is going to have the most resistance out there for weeds. But in fact, glyphosate belongs to the class of chemicals that's labeled here, this blue line with the letter G. And we have seen an increase in that. And it has been increasing since roughly the early 2000s. But there are some other forms of um, actions on how chemicals are affecting plants that have had much more of a resistance issue than glyphosate. Um, most of these other chemicals, the way they are attacking plants on a small acreage, you probably are not going to be using them very much. Um, glyphosate down here in the G and 2,4-D are probably two of the ones that are much easier for people to get a hold of. You don't have to have a permit, um, but there are different chemicals. And I wanted to touch base really quickly. This graph I like that showed sort of how different chemicals can potentially attack and kill weeds. So first thing that happens, of course, is you spray the weed. It's being um, penetrated into the leaf, the green tissue and it's translocated or it's being moved down through the plant into the different parts of the, the tissue, depends on um, which, which herbicide it is, how it's gonna go and where. But they're all gonna come and target some part of the plant, a target protein, outnumber the protein with the herbicide, and then bind to that so that I can kill that plant. So weeds have a very 
broad genetic database out there, loss of diversity. So that is allowing for them to have different ways of becoming resistant. So some plants are um, having reduced penetration. So a waxier leaf, for example, you're not gonna get as much product on and absorbed in as you would um, one that's not as waxy. Some of them are not letting um, the herbicide translocate down, or if they do go down, it's not going to the right protein for its target. Um, some of the targets proteins are being sort of like you think of them as Pac-Man, and they're going and eating the, um, and metabolizing the herbicide instead of the herbicide killing it. And then some of them, the target protein, there's, they're duplicating more of that so that the herbicide doesn't have a, as much of an advantage to attacking it. And then the proteins can change how they're growing so that this herbicide can't really get a good grip in there to be able to, um, to, to target that plant and kill it. So those are some of the different ways that plants are becoming resistant to it. Um, and as I mentioned, there's many different ways that um, the different chemicals are, are not being as effective. And some of these plants, plants are not just being resistant to one type of method that the herbicide is working on, but multiple. So the top line here, it's most common for plants to have um, two different ways of resisting. So two different types of chemicals, two different classes of chemicals will not work on a plant. There are 26 total different known sites of action for herbicides, 23 of those have some sort of a resistance. And as you can see here on the graph, there are some plants, not very many, but there are some plants that can um, resist 11 different types of herbicide classes. So they really have a good genetic diversity out there and they can still grow. Um, one of the biggest issues with this is if you go through and try to spray um, if you just use one type, one type of action, you're going to eliminate the population that is um, susceptible to that type of action and everything else will release and um, continue to grow and you'll have your resistance issue. So looking at some of the different chemicals um, and how many of them they have a resistance population Glyphosate is our, our trade name of Roundup is the most common, but it's a generic plant, um, generic herbicide. You can find this um, at any Home Depot, Lowe's, Ace Hardware, any farm supply, as well as 2,4-D down here on the bottom. Both of them are starting to see more resistance issues. And those are the two that are the easiest for you. You can go when we're done here tonight, you can go out to whatever local hardware stores next to you, purchase them and spray them on your, on your property tonight. Um, but these are the ones we are starting to see more of a resistance building up. So in looking at which weeds, this is again worldwide, but, um, so we don't have all of these resistance here in California yet, um, but I'm sure it's just going to be a matter of time. So it's a huge list. And again, you see we really had a spike um, of the dramatic increase in that. The ones I want to highlight, all of these in yellow, are weeds that we typically see on um, small ranchettes, um, both irrigated pasture and on um, annual rangeland. And some of them we've talked about already tonight that can have toxic issues like Johnson grass. Um, hairy fleabane and, and horseweed are two very common ones that are definitely resistant to glyphosate. Um, but we're getting things like um, rip gut brome and hair barley that are grasses that are becoming resistant to glyphosate prickly lettuce and annual sow thistle as well. Um, and Julie mentioned the barnyard grass, it recently has become resistant to it. So we wanna try and um, change things up, not use the same chemicals all the time to try and um, prevent some of our toxicity. One of the other things I've seen a lot of is people spraying too late. So want to touch really, really quickly on sort of phenology, sort of the stage of growth of our plants. And this is using, um, using annual grass, but annual forbs will go through the same type of growth cycle where we have a vegetative stage. This is when it's the easiest to kill these plants. Once it started going into its reproductive stage, um, you risk depending on a lot of different um, factors such as the plant itself, drought conditions, um, weather conditions on how fast those seeds can develop. 
R5 right here, this little yellow um, thing, sir, those are actually flowers on a grass. So if you've never seen flowers on a grass, you look closely, I'm gonna guess probably based on where you're at this year, we probably already had that happen. Um, but you can see those little little flowers on it. If you're really allergic to ryegrass, um, that's when those are flowering and you have the most pollen. After that, it very quickly can go through the reproductive stage for development of the seed kernel. And spraying any annual once it started to flower and once it started to develop any seeds, you're really wasting your time and money. Um, seeds are probably going to escape and not be killed. And so you're wasting your time and money because the annual plant is going to be dying soon anyway. So making sure you try and hit your spray, if you're going to do a spray in that early vegetative state, um, you can have better control and try to make sure you're not having any seeds escape. So hairy fleabane and um, horseweed are two that, as I mentioned, are becoming um, Roundup resistant or glyphosate resistant. They're very common on small par parcels. Um, I even see both of these in yards, along roadsides. You can see them almost anywhere. They both look very similar to each other in the rosette stage. This is the time you would want to try to spray them and kill them if you're gonna try to spray something. They both look, again, very similar when you get to the flower seeds, you've got these big poofy seeds. There's a few differences on them, um, but once you've hit this stage, I wouldn't even waste your time trying to spray them. Uh, you really wanna try and hit it when they're earlier in their life cycle. So this is sort of, again, fleabane and horseweed showing the, the resistance. They were sprayed with glyphosate and they are starting to regrow. Uh, this plant was only hit just a little bit on the edges, but it is starting to regrow. All right, good on time. So some of the take homes and it, um, we can have hopefully a few minutes for questions on this. Um, really, really make sure you follow all of the labels, making sure that you're applying the correct amount of herbicide you choose. I've had some people tell me that, well, when I say don't use glyphosate on that, it's, um, it's becoming resistant. I'm told by people, it's okay, I'll just spray more than what the label says. That really won't solve the problem and that'll set it up for a worse problem down the, down the road. So make sure that you're following the label using the proper amount that is um, recommended on the label. And to prevent a, um, an, an issue, using herbicides with a different form of action. Um, some herbicides, if they're in the same class of action, if it becomes resistant to one, it'll have a cross resistance to all of the other herbicides that fall in that same type of action. So again, looking at the label, reading it, calling your cooperative extension office and, and asking for some help, we would be able to help you to um, decide if they're in the same um, class of action and it wouldn't be worthwhile to try to use that spray. Um, as I mentioned, round, glyphosate and 2,4-D are the easiest ones you can go out and get without a permit. Any homeowner can go to the Home Depot or Lowe's next to them and purchase them. Um, the others, you would have to have a permit, but it's a pretty easy process of just going to your cooperative extension office, um, getting the study materials, taking the test of the ag commissioners, and then once you've passed that, it opens up a much wider range of um, products you can purchase. But on pastures, there are still um, very few that's actually approved for grazing. So we still have a limited number. So that's why I think using an integrated pest management approach and IPM approach is the best thing to do for, um, for weeds, just because you can um, decide if mowing works better, if you can time it right, as Davey mentioned with Yellow Star, maybe weed eating the patch, maybe um, hand pulling might be the best thing. If the weeds are already flowering, hand pulling and double bagging it and putting it in the trash can so you can prevent, um, prevent the spread of seeds. And if you do spray, make sure you spray at the right time so that you're not spraying too late. And if you have any other interest in that, uh, the UC does have a publication, it's old, it's from 2000, um, but other than the charts saying that we don't have any resistance issues in California, this is a really pretty good, easy to read publication that goes through and sort of explains some of the resistance issues and um, motive, motive actions from some of the different chemicals. Um, and it's a free download you can get from this website here.